Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and it's Monday, November 2nd, 2009, and this is the future of education. It's not daylight savings time anymore, so I apologize if you got the notice from me today and it still said Pacific or Eastern Daylight Time. I'm going to have to shift gears here. It is standard time, and if you're here, you're here at the right time, and we appreciate it. Uh, our special guests today are Catherine Mackey and Michael Horn from Innocide Institute, and they're here to discuss their new report on Florida virtual schools. So let's welcome them with a little clapping hand. This is your first actual use of interacting in this session today. There's a little clapping hand down at the bottom of the participant window. You'll get a chance to use that more today, I'm sure. Welcome, Michael and Catherine. Thank you. It's a uh, pleasure for both of us to be here, and uh, thank you for the opportunity, Steve. Well, it's very selfish of me to have you back on. I really uh, like what you're doing and um, appreciate the, that work, and I'm glad to be able to help it in any way that I can and also bring some visibility to it. Uh, the session is being recorded, so if you would like to listen to it later, you know someone who wanted to, it will be in the original event page that you used to come to this, or just go to futureofeducation.com or learncentral.org to find it. I'm going to start by giving a brief overview of the environment, the Illuminate environment here. Future Education is um, supported by Illuminate. I do work for Illuminate, and my project at Illuminate is called learncentral.org and it's a social network for educators, an educational network. It has Illuminate built in. You can hold events like this. You can connect with other people through uh, smaller Illuminate sessions, and there's a lot of fun in there. So please do visit learncentral.org. Coming up on the series, uh, actually on Saturday, is part of Classroom 2.0 Live, and Peggy George is in the room, and she's one of the co-hosts of that. But I don't think she's going to be there on Saturday. But Saturday morning, this coming Saturday morning, I'm going to talk about educational social networking. I'm releasing a white paper on it this week, and it should be a lot of fun to talk about. Uh, on November 9th, apropos to our discussion today for sure, is the Not School group from the UK and Michigan. They'll be on uh, talking directly about the Not School program. November 10th, Henry Jenkins. November 11th, uh, Halverson and Collins on their book, Rethinking Education in the Age of Technology. November 12th, Larry Cuban from Stanford. November 19th, Howard Rheingold is back again for more brainstorming. Then in December, Dan Willingham on why students don't like school, Bob Compton on 2 million minutes, although Bob's going to have to reschedule that, so it will probably be in January. December 3rd, Curtis Bonk on The World is Open, Angela Myers on Classroom Habitudes, and then Sherry Toledo on the Web 2.0 Education Survey that she's run. Lots of fun coming up. More Howard Rheingold, James Paul G., Clay Shirky, Doc Searle, Tim Magner, David Thornburg, Dennis Lipke, and just confirmed Sir Ken Robinson, so that should be a lot of fun. If this is your first time at Illuminate, you have some ways to interact here. This is a participative environment. You'll notice the participant window shows you who else is here. You can send messages in the chat to everybody. Uh, you can also send messages to another individual who's in the session, but do be aware that the moderators, Michael, Catherine, and I will actually see those so they're not fully private. Below the participant window are some ways to respond without talking. If you just want to clap your hand like we did earlier, use a smiley face. There's a confused or frowny look, and then a thumbs down. There's a bigger button to the left of that a hand with a green up arrow. Clicking on that says you want the microphone, which we're glad to do later, so please feel free to do that, and then we'll have you take the mic. If you think you'd like to ask a question through the microphone, do be sure to go up now to Tools Audio, run the audio setup wizard to make sure your mic is configured correctly. The whiteboard to the right, and we're not going to use much today, but we will use it for a second just to allow you to tell us where you're listening from. I'm going to give you all permissions to modify that board, and you do so by clicking on the little wand with the red star at the end, and then you click on the map to let us know where you're listening from. And I was thinking we might be a US-only audience, today, but look at that, Canada and France. And anybody else want to shout out where they're listening from? Hawaii. I think that's you, Davila, right? Oh, Italy. How about that? Well, wherever you're listening from, it's a lot of fun to have you here today. And I am going to now turn the time over to uh, Michael and Catherine to introduce themselves. 
talk a little about the report. I, I did read through it with some fascination. And Michael, I don't know if you want to continue the way we did last time, where you kind of uh, host. If so, that's fine. If you feel like you need me to step in and ask any questions, I'll do so. But otherwise, I'm now at your service. And that is quite a, uh, an introduction, Steve, uh, to, put us, uh, to, to put you at our service. But we're fortunate to have you there and uh, fortunate that you uh, continue to host this amazing series. You've already seen uh, the comments, just marveling at, at the people, not least of you uh, yourself, on November 7th, which we'll all look forward to tuning into. Uh, so as mentioned, my name is Michael Horn. I'm the Executive Director of Education of Innocite Institute. And, uh, which is a nonprofit think tank devoted to applying the theories of disruptive innovation, which were developed by Clayton Christensen of uh, the Harvard Business School, uh, to suggest solutions to problems in the social sector. We came out uh, with the book Disrupting Class about a year and a half ago that framed a lot of these ideas and discussed a lot of these theories. And what we've been embarking on uh, in the last several months, and, and, and will be for many, many more months, we hope, uh, is authoring case studies that at a much level, deeper level detail uh, what these disruptive innovations in education look like and start to, uh, uh, start to allow us to see how we might foster them and move them more and more toward a student-centric system. But at the most basic guide, uh, we, are, uh, we are trying to describe this phenomenon. I've been lucky to have at my side uh, for the last uh, year and change now, Catherine Mackey as a research fellow at Innocent Institute. Catherine comes to us uh, from having an extensive experience in education from a uh, publishing house to a teacher in Utah to uh, uh, a master's degree from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And so uh, we've been lucky to have her. And uh, thank you for joining us today, Catherine, on this interview. Thank you. I am so happy to be here. Um, and uh, what I guess what we want to start with, th this case study focused on the Florida Virtual School, Catherine, and, and I think there's a lot of interesting elements, but just to start us off on it, can you give us an idea of um, really, really what is the Florida Virtual School today? If someone came in and, and didn't know anything about it, how would you describe uh, what the Florida Virtual School is? The Florida Virtual School is a supplemental online program. Um, it serves students in Florida, um, in nationally and globally. It's um, free for Florida students, whether they are public school students, private school students, or homeschooled students. And, um, and then students outside of Florida um, can pay for the courses. Um, so Florida Virtual School began in 1997 with only 77 students and today has over 154,125 students, I mean, within 70,000 different enrollments. So, so it's, uh, it's an interesting thing that it's an online school that's, that's exploded with this growth that you just alluded to. When you think about um, the very beginning of it and how it started to get into this growth, um, where did it start from? It, it, obviously, it, it obviously didn't start out hatched out of its shell uh, with, with, all this, with all these students enrolled in an online school in Florida. So, so what, what are its origins? So the idea for Florida Virtual School actually began in, separately in two Florida school districts. Um, Orange, in Orange County Public Schools, which is a large urban district in Orlando, um, an AP computer science teacher wanted to put her course online in order to reach more students in the county. And two teachers in the district also wanted to create an online SAT prep class um, that they hoped would be able to help students in the district prepare for the SAT test better. Meanwhile, in Alachua County Public Schools, which is a rural district in Florida, um, a man by the name of Bob Muni, who is a businessman and had some, some of his children were attending schools in Alachua. Um, he came up with the idea on a napkin one day, actually, of um, creating an online program, learning program, that would um, incorporate business principles. And so, and he presented that to the district. And both of these districts applied for a $200,000 
Grace and Mills grant from the Florida Department of Education in 1996. And when the Florida Department of Education was reviewing the applications, it noticed the similarities between the two programs. And it said to the district um, that they would give them the funding if they agreed to jointly um, create a statewide online learning program with that money. And so the districts agreed. And um, they recruited 15 individuals from the two districts to work on this initiative. And um, during the first few years, the teachers and staff members were on loan from the schools. Um, this, they did this for two reasons. One, they could use all of the funding for the school and didn't have to pay the salaries. And the other was that there were actually a lot of doubts about whether the program would actually work out. And if it didn't work, then, this, then the teachers and the staff members could go back to their prior positions. That's really interesting, and, and I'm, I'm looking at Peggy's uh, uh, message on the chat board about the book called The Back of the Napkin, which has gotten a lot of acclaim uh, over, the past, uh, over the past year or so, and, and uh, really thinking about, gosh, $200,000 Break the Mold grant was all that it started with, and uh, started serving how many students in the first year? In the first year, there were 77 students. And it's grown all the way to serving over 100,000 students? 70,000 students, actually. 154,000 enrollments. I mixed that up before. Gosh. So just uh, so explosive growth. And, and from, from this meager start of $200,000, which I think there's a really interesting lesson in that, um, how, how did it start to grow so much? What, what, what were those key steps, those key policy levers um, that were put in place to allow this to grow? I think one of the reasons why Florida Virtual School has, well, there are many reasons why Florida Virtual School has been so successful and why it has experienced such explosive growth. Um, one of them, of course, is that the team that was put together were very forward thinking and thought out of the box. Um, and that was very important. Another, and I'll talk about that a little bit later more, but I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the policies that really gave the school grow, the room to grow. Um, I think one of the reasons why it's been so successful is because Florida Virtual School had the support of many of, the, of Florida's key um, pol political figures at the time. Um, and these people, including Governor Jeb Bush, they were able to see the online learning would be would add value to the students. And this is at a time when online learning wasn't the norm, especially for high school students. And for them to have this vision was very forward thinking. Um, so, so, so they, they developed this vision um, and, and, start, and, and there's obviously some big political support around that. Um, what, what are the trigger policies in, in, in your mind um, put in place well, actually, let me ask. Let me back up and even even further. Who were the first students um, in the Florida Virtual School? Who who who, who, who did they first serve? Um, yeah, who who did they first serve? Are these high school students, and, and why would they start to? What was in it for them to take an online course? Florida Virtual School started out as a high school. Now it has expanded to um, serve high school, middle school, and this year elementary school students. Um, the first students. Well, the first year that Florida Virtual School was in session, um, the students were from Orange and Alachua counties. The next year it expanded to serve the state. Um, in Alachua, the problem was that many of the students, it was a rural district, and many of the students, and many of the schools had a hard time bringing in AP teachers um, to the schools. And so they, sorry. And so what, what, one of these key things um, that you're starting to talk about is that the student experience that from Alachua, they were in rural school districts, so they didn't have courses um, possible within their schools because they were resource constrained. Mm -hmm. And so they would start to take these online courses um, uh, because literally they had no other access to them otherwise. So it was, exactly. it was classic non-consumption. Exactly. What about in Orange? Was, was that more of an urban situation? In Orange, it's an urban district. And so what happened is many students would have difficulty 
um, getting into classes because the classes were the class sizes were so large that a lot of classes that they needed to take to graduate or that they wanted to take would be filled. And so through Florida Virtual School, um, these students were able to take courses that they otherwise wouldn't have had an option of taking. So would these be examples like foreign language? Um, and, and things like that that might have only been offered at one period during the day or something like that? Exactly. And one of the most popular high school courses actually from Florida Virtual School is PE. And I think the reason that... School education? Yeah. Really? I think a lot of students like to do that because some students just don't feel comfortable um, playing sports with other students and doing it on their own is much easier and much more comfortable. That's so, that's so interesting. So how do they certify in a physical education class that, that they're actually doing it? Is there other weekly reports that they fill out or, or how does that? They fill out reports saying how much they've been exercising, what exercises they've been doing, and they have a list of different exercises they're supposed to try and the program actually will show them how to do it. Oh, that's so interesting. That's so interesting. I actually didn't, I didn't realize that at all. Uh, and so they started targeting these students, 77 we said in the first year, which started to grow quite a bit. How were they funded initially? Initially, they were, well, the first year the Florida Virtual School started, they were funded through the $200,000 break mold grant. And I think it's significant um, to note that it wasn't, invest it wasn't a multi-million dollar investment that started the school. It was a small $200,000 grant. And after that grant expi expired at the end of 1997, the, state, the Florida Vir Department of Education began funding Florida Virtual School as a line item in the state budget. So that means each year the legislature would come together um, and actually say, we're going to pay you this amount of money in the budget, and they would come up with that number how? Exactly. So each year, Florida Virtual School didn't know how much money they would be receiving from the state. They would, they would give them the report of how many students had been in the school the next year, and then the legislature would try to figure out from that what they thought the enrollment would be the next year. And of course it was never exactly correct because Florida Virtual School was always growing, so they always seemed to have more students than they had funds. More demands than they had funding. That's really interesting. And, and that was because they would cap um, a, a, a set uh, number of teacher, or excuse me, of students per teacher so that you were locked in to um, when you received your funding, you knew how many students that meant you could serve. That's right. The school wanted to make sure that the students received the individualized attention that they needed. And so they put a cap of 150 students per teacher. Now this year that cap has changed because due to budget cuts, they've had to increase that number. Okay. That, that's really interesting. Now um, there, there's some questions coming in, a lot of questions coming in. Um, one of them is, uh, it goes to the heart of the student experience. So, so the question is around the peer contact that students have. Um, but I guess it, uh, if you could talk about, do they ever have in-person contact, or is this totally a distance uh, learning phenomenon? And then I guess the second part of it is from the student experience. What, what does it look like? I sign up for a Florida virtual school course, and then what happens? As far as I know, um, this is just a virtual program. So the students only have virtual contact with each other. Now, if they get together outside of the program, that's up to them, but there are many opportunities for them to meet on Florida Virtual School um, premises, so to say. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of discussion forums. They actually even have clubs and newspapers for the students to be involved in. Um, and so the students actually have quite a bit of, of contact with each other, talking with each other over the internet. That's interesting. I, I actually remember reading um, just in the last few days uh, an article in the Wall Street Journal uh, that was talking about how that lack of social interaction for some students has been has, has been worrisome to them. Um, and so, like you said, these student clubs that they've started to form have been a great outlet for them to get together. And then if they say are in a mock UN team, mm -hmm. right before the meeting, they'll all meet with each other and they get that in-person contact yes. in that way. But it's important also to remember that these students aren't attending Florida Virtual School full-time. They are going to their full-time school. So this is just a supplement to it. So they have all of that student contact at school. So the students that are meeting through Florida Virtual School is in addition to... Gotcha. That's really, that, that is a really interesting point. So these are, uh, especially in the early years, mm -hmm. 
um, and we'll talk about the difference with middle school in, in, in a little bit. But you know, of course, the full-time program that started this year would be different, but I'm not as familiar with how that. Okay, but but initially, uh, this is a supplemental mm -hmm. for the most part. So students were full-time in a bricks-and-mortar school, exactly. and then would take one online course, two online courses mm -hmm. through Florida Virtual. High school students generally take one course a semester on average. Um, middle school students often. The majority of the students who are taking it through middle school, who are in middle school, are actually homeschooled students, and so they usually take four per semester. Uh, okay, so that's that's interesting. And so now it starts to grow. Um, you said that initially it was a state appropriation um, for each uh, for each um, for each year, I guess, and then that set the number of students they could serve in a exactly. given year. So it would be, how much money are we talking about? A million dollars? Six million dollars? Think, think, things around that order of magnitude? Um, yeah, and so while, while you double check my, my numbers on that, just to make sure I'm, I'm right, the, um, the, uh, so the, I'm sorry, so in the first year the budget was 1.3 million. And luckily, the school has strong political support from the governor's office, the Florida Department of Education, and key legislative committees. Um, and so each year, the funding continued to grow. By 2003, which was the last year that they received the line in funding, the appropriation was 6.9 million. So it grew from 1.3 million to 6.9 million. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and so from there, uh, one of the questions, I guess, is so they're expanding students, but you mentioned there's a lot of there's a huge wait list developing. Mm -hmm. So what do they do? What what in the financial circumstances or, or what happened um, to allow this explosive growth? I, I'm I'm, I'm going to guess here from from, uh, from from what I know that they probably said, well, line item appropriation isn't going to carry this thing forward. Yeah. So by 2002. Florida Virtual School had a huge wait list of students on, and a lot of districts weren't very happy about this because they wanted their students to take these courses. They they come to realize how important it was to these students because they couldn't offer these courses, and they wanted the students to receive them. And um, so, Florida Virtual School started um, looking for other options, and then in 2003, um, due to um, some changes in the general Florida education landscape, Florida Virtual School was forced to change their funding model. And it was at that time that they adopted the um, per pupil, weighted per pupil funding model that exists for the rest of the school districts in Florida. Um, but Florida's model was a little bit different because um, since their supplemental program, they received one sixth of a full time equivalent student. Um, for every full year course that a student takes. Now there are a little, there's some weighted appropriations that are also added to that, but that's generally how it works. So let's highlight that it's one sixth of a, of, of a full time equivalent student for each full year course. Mm -hmm. okay. Which would be two enrollments. Okay, interesting. And, and so this funding model, um, so whenever a student signs up, Florida Virtual School immediately gets one sixth of the FTE from the state funds. Um, is there any cash to that? Yes. So the catch is, um, historically, Florida schools um, received their per pupil funding um, as a result of it's distributed according to two headcounts are taken throughout the school year. And Florida Virtual School knew that um, to have these headcounts would kind of take away the whole purpose of online learning, which is to be able to learn any place, any time. They didn't want these seat restraints, and so Florida Virtual School, under Julie's direct, Julie Young's direction, who's the CEO of Florida Virtual School now, um, they came up with a performance-based funding program where the school receives funding only for those students who successfully complete a, comport, uh, complete a course. And what this means is that the students need to pass the final exam of the course and pass the course. Gotcha. So, so they actually, it's actually a more rigorous uh, bar that they have to clear <laughs> for them to get funding, which is really interesting. Um, so, but it was also because you had to preserve that unique element of online learning. Yeah. That's really interesting. Now, we're getting a lot of questions about. Interestingly, though, Florida Virtual School has had an 80 to 90 percent completion rate. 
since they began. 80 to 90 percent of students are successfully mm -hmm. completing the courses. Wow. Now, and that means that they're staying in the course until the end. That's really interesting. Now, one question we're getting um, from a lot of people right now is, uh, what does the role of a teacher look like? Are there parent-teacher conferences? <laughs> um, what is professional development for teachers? Um, okay. Start with any part of that, and then I'll, I'll keep pushing you. <laughs> okay, so the teachers work remotely from home. Um, the school sets them up with a computer, with a phone line, with internet connection, and um, the, stu the teachers are required to be available for the students from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. every single day. It didn't start out that way, but um, as the school was as was going along, they realized that students needed more access to the teachers, and, and so that develop, that change developed. So that's a policy for the teachers. You have to be online from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. or available. Okay, from 8 a.m. Mm -hmm. 8 to 8 p.m. Okay. And so the teachers don't have any face-to-face -face interaction with their students, but they interact with them by way of email, phone calls, inter I mean, online discussion forums, um, internet, I'm sorry, texting, instant messages. Mm. Um, they're in constant contact with them. Most of the teachers who work for Florida Virtual School had worked in the traditional school system before, and the ones I've talked to have said that they feel like they have a much deeper relationship with their students now than they did when they were working in a traditional school system because they're in constant contact with them, and it's one-on-one -on -one contact they have with their students. Um, Florida Virtual School, even though it is a virtual school, they are committed to having a high-touch environment, which means that there is much interaction. So the students are working online. Um, all of the course content is there for the students, um, and then they use the teachers when they have questions. Um, the teachers grade the work. Gotcha. Okay. And what about parents, how do they factor in? Are there, are there teacher parent conferences? So the teachers are required to call the parents, e the parent of each of their students once a month. Okay. And um, at that time, they have a discussion with how the student is doing the student's progress. And gotcha. so I guess so that's their term of it would be a normal uh, parent-teacher conference. Except, except for it's once a month instead of once a semester. And it's virtual. Exactly. Wow. Um, uh, there, there are a couple questions around teachers also. Uh, Steve points out um, that, that the teachers only have annual contracts. They're not tenured. Exactly. Um, so the and they, they retain, hire and retain teachers based on the teacher's performance. They're able to do this by issuing one-year contracts. And also, none of the teachers are part of a union. Gotcha. Um, and they have 150 students, or now a little bit more um, per mm -hmm. each teacher, but historically 150 yes. students to each teacher. And so when they're teaching, um, a full-time teacher would be 150 um, students, a part-time teacher would maybe be 25 or 50 students mm -hmm. or something like that. Is that yes. how you think about that? Yes. Okay. Um, and then uh, a, a question, I want to make sure I get this, um, are all the teachers living in Florida, uh, Florida from Florida Virtual School? So it started out where all the teachers were living in Florida, but now there are teachers living all over the United States. The majority are still in Florida. And that's because for certain subject areas they needed expertise outside or people have moved out of Florida? People have moved out of Florida or people outside of Florida have expressed interest. Oh, wow. Okay. I mean... Yeah, and, and Florida Virtual School itself is now serving a lot of students outside of Florida. Mm -hmm. um, I think you alluded to it earlier, but there's that, um, in the case, it's called Global Services in the section. What, what are they set up there, and what are they, what are they doing outside of Florida? Um, so Global Services provides course content to students that don't live in Florida. Um, since they don't live in Florida, these students do need to pay. Um, so sometimes it's individual students that will sign up to take courses through Florida Virtual School. Sometimes it's districts or, or schools that will pay for the content and provide it to their students. And these, um, these students take the same courses that the Florida students take. Um, they work with Florida Virtual School teachers. Gotcha. They're actually special global services teachers. but. It, but but in, it's within the uh, offices of Florida Virtual exactly. School. But you could also buy the curriculum um, from Florida Virtual School and offer it with your local teachers or yes. something like that. And that's through the franchises. Okay. Florida set up a number of franchises. At the time when they had 
many students on wait lists, some of the districts really wanted their students, to, some of the larger districts wanted their students to be able to take classes and so that Broward County, for example, um, approached Florida Virtual School and said, can we have our own teachers teach the students this course, these courses? And then they started setting up franchises and I think right now they have about eight franchises in Florida. Um, and with the franchises, um, Florida Virtual School gives them this district the curriculum. The district hires the teachers um, and to teach that curriculum to the students in the district. That's great. Uh, now, I, Gary's asking a question of, uh, does the state of Florida issue the diploma? And I think the answer to that is, until recently, until this year, in fact, it's never been a, um, a diploma-granting institution. It's still not a, it's still not a diploma. It's still not a diploma-granting institution. Initially, um, Florida Virtual School, when Julie and her team were creating the school, they wanted to have a diploma-granting um, full-time institution, and there was a lot of concern among educators in Florida that Florida Virtual School would take over the traditional schools, and, and so sort of to alienate, sort of mitigate the fear they decided to create a supplemental program instead. Um, and since then, they've, they've thought of issuing diplomas, and every time they ask the students, the students say, no, we don't want a diploma granting program. We like it this way. That's interesting. Something that I picked up in reading the course was all, excuse me, in reading the case, uh, was that uh, not going the diploma granting route initially actually led um, them to be much more welcomed by the districts within Florida because they didn't see it as encroaching upon their turf. Yes, so um, the line item funding model, which they adopted after the grant ran out, um, was actually very good for Florida when it was first starting out um, because the way it worked is they, Florida Virtual School received so much money for their students to be able to take courses. And when a student from, when these students took the courses, the schools weren't losing any money. Um, so the schools didn't see Florida Virtual School as a threat. And this sort of gave um, Florida Virtual School a shelter in which they were able to grow the program and to develop the courses and, um, sh and prove that they were able to provide value to the students. And the schools saw them as a great help so by the time Florida Virtual School went, went to that. Yeah, began competing against the schools for, for people funding, um, the, the schools actually, they thought they they were afraid, Florida Virtual School was afraid the schools would be upset and nothing happened. And the schools knew that Florida Virtual School was a great school and was providing services to their students and didn't mind losing that small amount of money that they were. It's, it's worth going over this point that Steve just brought up, that the list of reasons Florida Virtual School was accepted um, by regular schools r really is worth going over. So if, if, I he if I'm hearing you right, one of the first things is that they were not diploma granting early on. The second thing was that they had a very different value proposition, which was we're going to help make the rural schools and the urban schools that exist today even better mm -hmm. by being able to better serve their own students. Mm -hmm. And then a third thing that you just brought up was that the initial funding model actually um, did not compete directly against the schools. It wasn't stealing money from them or, or steal, as a lot of charters uh, are set up to do uh, because it, they were still owning the students and they were still keeping the funds. Am I reading that correctly? That's correct. Are there other, um, are there other things or are those the three principal things that, that contributed to it or am I missing anything? Those are the three principles that contributed to um, the schools not feeling that Florida Virtual School is taking away their competition. Gotcha. And then Steve obviously quickly pointed out that there was another thing um, that helped, which was that there was a lot of uh, growing uh, enrollment. Uh, Rob, I see in there, stealing is an unfair characterization. Better serving the needs of students is a better term. <laughs> um, I think it's an interesting point, though, that I want to sit on for a second, um, if I may which is that from the perspective of the schools, it is stealing. And one of the, um, what, and, and as abhorrent as that might be, and, and, and misguided characterization as, as it might be in some cases, that is the perspective, I think. And one of the powers of disruptive innovation specifically is that you go where the existing system is motivated not to go. Um, and it's happy that you're there. And I think that's really the, the symbiotic relationship that the Florida Virtual School set up 
inside the state of Florida was this very symbiotic relationship um, where they said, yes, help us, and, and it was a welcoming one for the most part. There have obviously been some hiccups, uh, but, but for the most part, it's, it's, it's been that relationship of we're helping you to better serve your students. And also Florida Virtual School is providing the courses that the school, that the brick and mortar schools aren't able to provide to their students. Mm. Yeah, no, so that's, that, uh, glad, 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 Rob, uh, that you agree. Uh, the, um, but, it, but it's an it, it is an interesting point, which is this perspective, um, from, from, uh, from different sides of where you sit is sort of which, which shapes uh, how you view this disruption. One question um, is how, you know, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. sounds like a long time to be on call for a teacher, seven days a week, and uh, is, are, are they really working 12 hours well, a day or is it just on call? Is the teachers have 24 hours to respond to students' emails and to grade their work okay. once they return it in. So they don't necessarily need to be at their computer for all that time, but they probably always have their cell phone with them. Just to be, <laughs> to be in an emergency. Exactly. Gotcha. Um, so, so slight clarification then to the earlier point. And then another question um, that, I'll, that I'll jump in and answer uh, from the message board is, 150 students seems like a lot for a teacher, but if you actually, and, and this is high school, if you actually do the math, most students are teaching, excuse me, most teachers in America are teaching 25 to 30 students in five periods a day. Mm -hmm. So it's actually the, uh, roughly the same uh, okay. when, 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 when you With work. With 150 right. students, it works out to be about 25 students per course for Florida Virtual School. Gotcha. Okay. Um, now... And you have to remember also that these teachers aren't preparing the courses. They are just teaching them and acting as tutors. So that's a really interesting point that let's, let's spend some time on because Florida Virtual School and, and really a lot of the online schools have shifted the role of the teacher quite mm -hmm. dramatically. Um, and as you just said, the content's already there. In many cases, the delivery of the lessons is already there. So what does a teacher do? What is their role um, throughout the day? So the teacher's primary role is to act as a tutor for the student. Um, to work one-on-one -on -one with them when they have questions, to make sure they understand um, the work. If, if they need additional help, they bring in additional materials to them. They find ways to work with the student where the student will learn best. Gotcha. Um, so it's, it's, it's much more of a one-on-one -on -one role. Now, I know Florida Virtual School um, has more constructivist elements of the curriculum, perhaps, than other places, so more project-based learning mm -hmm. uh, and, and things like that. So are there a lot of group um, facilitations of, of, discuss of discussions among students that they might also do and things like that? They have, yeah, they have a lot of discussion boards um, that the students and the teachers participate in. Um, they might, one of the teachers, for example, might have an illuminate session where all the students log on and they use that. Gotcha. Now, uh, I, I think it was just summarized very, very nicely by uh, by Robbie on the board, which is that the teacher shifts really to becoming a facilitator of learning much more than the stand and deliver uh, model. Now, in terms of the virtual credits, I'll, I'll take this. Um, those are just recognized as being, again, granted by the parent school, the bricks and mortar school. So Florida Virtual School is not actually giving any credits, per se, to the student. They're just being recognized by the high school. So for a college admissions, they wouldn't know where you necessarily took the course. Is that right? Okay. So um, we, think, we think that's right. We'll double check that uh, afterwards, and if we're wrong, we'll clarify that. But. Uh, it, that is an interesting question, which is the year-round nature then, and I want to jump on this too because this seems to me particularly from our perspective, which is not just online learning and disruptive innovation, but transforming this to a student-centric system. Um, one of the, so we've just talked about the shift in the role of the teacher. You've also shifted the element of time, and you said it earlier, you can learn anywhere, anytime, any place. Uh, and on and on. What does that do to a student's experience? How, how does that? How does that? How is that unique? Is it still on an agrarian calendar? Do they tend to work during the traditional hours of the school day? What, how does that change things up? Um, it gives the students a lot more freedom to be able to work when and where they want to. 
some students um, might want to want to Florida virtual. They might during the school day they might go to the library and work on their Florida virtual school program. Okay. Others might want to go home and work from it, on it from there. Some might want to do it at one in the morning. Some teachers say that they're getting work from students at three in the morning. Um, maybe on the weekends is when they want to work. And some students um, might be bored in their class and think, oh, I can do this faster and complete the course really quickly. Well, some, the, their course might be too difficult for them and they need to go a little slower. And this way the student doesn't feel any pressure to work at the same pace as the other students in the class. Steve just made a joke about how it sounds like how he works. It <laughs> certainly describes me as well. So, um, as uh, much to the chagrin of people who work with me, like Catherine. But um, the uh, th so that's an interesting point, which is it's, it's something that's well understood that everyone learns differently. Everyone certainly works differently. Uh, and there's been lots of characterizations about what these differences are. One that we haven't that no one disagrees on anyway, is that we learn at different paces. Um, some people really grab something quickly and some people need more time to wrestle with it. Uh, when, when Julie Young and the folks at Florida Virtual were creating this, was that something that they were very conscious about? Were, were they addressing, were they addressing a certain report or, or, or trying to think about this factor in a unique way? When Julie and her team were first um, creating the school, they wanted to create a school that was very different from the brick and mortar schools. And the and luckily for them, they had the support of the political figures in Florida who encouraged them to do this and created legislation that allowed them to do this. Um, so basically, Julie and our team had a blank slate. And they looked at education and they said, if, if the rules for schools didn't exist, what would they be? And they reinvented school um, from a student perspective keeping the student at the center of their mind. And they wanted to create a school that would very much serve the needs of those students whose needs were not being served by the brick and mortar schools. Um, and so they wanted to create a system that was accessible for the students, that worked around their schedule, worked around how they learned, um, and what would work best for them. And I think Florida Virtual School has done a very Good job at that. Um, a couple of things that they did in order to create that system, in addition to having um, the teachers available from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., um, you can enroll in courses any time throughout the year. Um, during the summer, you can start a course any day of the year that you want to. It didn't start out that way, but as the school evolved, that was a policy that they added. Um, because they're internet courses, you can work on it from any computer, any place you want to. Gotcha. Um, and one question that we're getting right now that I'll just jump in, um, Steve Taffy's asking some really good questions throughout, is uh, he assumes that the teacher adapts grading practices to that of the school of record for the student. Is that correct? What does the grade distribution look like in the Florida Virtual School versus brick and mortar schools? Do we actually have that data? Is that something that's even known? Um, the, the advanced placement data is something we could talk about, mm -hmm. um, which which is that it, it, it But the works. grading distribution, I believe, is pretty similar to the brick and mortar schools. Okay. Um, now the, so there's a couple points I want to jump out there and I'll highlight one of them myself, which is, uh, that's exactly right, the flexible start dates. And, and there's an interesting anecdote I had when I was talking with Andy Ross, who works at the Florida Virtual School. I said, you know, gosh, Andy, there's a lot of summer school cutbacks right now. Um, all throughout, you guys must be a huge solution to summer school. And he looked at me and he said, um, he, he looked at me and said, uh, what? And I said, well, you know, summer school, you must be, he said, I don't understand the question. I said, well, summer school is getting cut. Seems like a huge area of non-consumption. We can use you more and more. And he said, oh, he said, no, well, we have start dates whenever, so I don't think of it in terms of that. That may be true, but I don't know. He said, you know, people start whenever they're ready to start and they end whenever they complete it successfully. We manage the macro time to some degree, but that's about it. And he said, really what we have with each teacher is 150 different classes because each student is in his or her unique place based on what they know at the time and based on what they need next. And I thought that was just a revolutionary way of, uh, of transforming the way I, 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 I sort of saw the whole model, which was just each student has his own or her own class. Is that 
Is that something that, that comes across a lot when you were visiting with them down in Florida and so forth? That is really interesting. I hadn't heard that before, but that is exactly how it is. I like the idea of 150 different classes that the teacher has. Yeah. So now um, an interesting question, I guess, that I want to jump into. I'm trying to see if I've missed some. Another thing is I didn't address the professional development. Ah, go to the professional development, yes. Florida Virtual School provides a lot of, of professional development, actually. Um, many of the teachers who are teaching at Florida Virtual School have not, obviously, have probably not done online learning before. So um, they provide a lot of training for that at the beginning, um, a lot of mentoring. And they have professional development both online for the student, for the teachers, and also um, when I visited Florida Virtual School, their building is two floors, and the whole, the entire first floor is devoted to professional development and training of teachers. And they have many conference area, rooms for the teachers to come in for that. And that's one area that Florida Virtual School is very strong in the professional development. That's really interesting. So there's a combination of both online professional development with tons of resources, mm -hmm. as well as physical mm -hmm. in, inside the building. Yeah. Now, um, w when they think about uh, assessing the job that this teacher has done and so forth, have they built tools to assess this, or, or how do they go about that? They have, in the same way that the students and the teachers don't have, I mean, the, yeah, the students and the teachers don't have face-to-face -face interaction, neither do the administrators and the teachers. It's not like a brick and mortar school where the principal can drop by the teacher's classroom and see how things are or going. choose not to drop by, as <laughs> often is the case, yeah. And so what they did is they, they created some programs um, where they're able to assess the student, the teachers. They can actually go into the virtually visit the classrooms um, by going into the teacher's file, well, not files, but into the program mm -hmm. and seeing how the teachers are assessing the student work, how the students are progressing. Um, basically, anything that happens in the class, the in administrators have access to. Gotcha. And, and now Dave's uh, chiming in there. I appreciate it, Dave, so that you're clarifying that all teachers are really in a class where they can, can com communicate with each other and, and share screens and so forth. Uh, one question is, uh, do the teachers have to live in Florida to work at the school? And we answered that earlier, um, but just to reiterate what, what I heard you say was that um, most of the teachers do live in Florida, but not all. Mm -hmm. And that's been because teachers have moved out of the state, others have caught wind of it and wanted to work for them. Mm -hmm. um, and the third reason was in certain uh, specialties that they wanted to ask, uh, offer a specific course, they needed to go outside Florida to get the teachers. That, those are the three, uh, yeah. Um, now, there, uh, let's, let's see where to go from here. The results. Um, who, how, how do the students do in Florida virtual school? You already said that 80 to 90 percent completion rates. Yeah, that completion which sounds rates phenomenal. are really great. Um, it's difficult because we you can't look at the, we can't look at the um, state test that the Florida students take because many of the students are private are also attend private schools or homeschooled and so we only have results for the public school students so we weren't able to look at those tests but we were able to look at the AP results and it's pretty astounding what we have seen um, students that Florida students that took Florida virtual school AP classes. Um, performed remarkably well. Um, in almost every subject, um, students, Florida Virtual School students performed better than uh, Florida students, and oftentimes even better than the nation. So if you look at page 16 of the case study, if you have access to that, um, yeah, there's a great amazing. chart. There's a great chart in there um, on page 16 if you, if you download it. Uh, that, that, that gives that distribution of how they've outperformed both Florida as well as the country mm -hmm. on advanced placement courses. Um, there, there's some questions right now that, that it may be uh, around, um, has there been methodology uh, for, for uh, creating shared space for students to help each other in study groups and so forth? There's a teacher in, in this uh, in room right now, Dave, who's answering a lot of these questions, so I think we should probably defer uh, to, to Dave. Okay. I don't know if we can give the mic actually, Steve, um, to, to him, but uh, th that might be helpful to give a bit of a, we've been, we've been doing what we uh, know about teaching involvement from our research, but uh, Dave, are you, Dave, are you there and able to take the uh, mic? 
Um, oh yes, it looks like I'm here and my mic is actually plugged in today. Great. If, if you could address uh, that, that question about um, creating shared space for the students to participate in study groups with each other and how teachers would set up discussions and so forth, I think that would be really helpful because that question has appeared several times. Hello. Oh, there it goes. Um, I've done it a couple times uh, where I've assigned um, a virtual room for some students and gone in there and, and helped out with some things for a virtual class or for the, um, uh, hold on just a second here. There we go. Now I'm sitting down. Um, I've done it a couple times where I've gone in to work with some students all at once. Um, I mainly teach some math classes. I teach both middle school and algebra one. So when I've had students that are working on the same um, areas and they both need some tutoring or some helping and some help with a same, the similar concepts, I'll bring them in together. But usually it's just done as a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and I use a combination of the phone and the whiteboards as well as, um, I'm not sure what other people are using. We're using uh, Wimba, the Wimba suite for, for things, uh, so I've used Pronto for it. The, um, the other thing is, I don't know if anybody's talked yet, maybe I missed it, about the way the curriculum is delivered or the lessons are delivered, because I think that's something that, um, something that, that, we need to, that needs to be explained so that people understand just why you don't always have to do um, like a large classroom presentation or that working with 150 students um, isn't the same as if you have 150 in one classroom at the same time in a brick and mortar. Um, Basically, the way the lessons are delivered is they're set up in modules which are similar to chapters where each module is broken into lessons. Um, and the student will, will go at their own pace. So they may, they'll start at module one, lesson one, and then they'll read through their lesson and there's tabs at the top of the screen where they'll be able to go from the lesson to some exercises to some practice materials. And at the end of every lesson there's an assessment um, which isn't necessarily a test or a quiz, of course. It's you know a way for the student to see how they're doing. And a lot of that is automatically graded for them so they get immediate feedback on how they're doing. Um, ours is set up so that they can uh, go back in and take any assessments at a second time uh, because we're you know more interested in do they get the concept at some point, not do they get it that very first time they tried it. Um, so it it's goes on that sort of model when a student, um, and some of the questions do have to be graded by the teacher. So I'll be able to go in and I can review how the student did. I can see their work. They can submit things. They can submit a Word document or um, another type of word processing file to me. They also can go in and um, uh, just type in a response so I can see the responses that way. And it really helps me get a feel for how they're doing because where I'm teaching math classes, they're not just putting in answers. They're actually showing their work and, and typing each line out. And I think sometimes because they've done it on paper, they'll be copying it into the computer in order to send it to me. It's really helping them because it's slowing them down. They're able to see how they're doing their work as well. Um, and then I can go ahead and review that and I can find where the problems are. Um, I just had a student tonight and I just got off the phone with him, um, the actual phone, right before the presentation started where he was doing, um, he had some word problems and he had correctly came, uh, arrived at a formula to help him understand how to solve the problem, but he had the answer to the math problem as opposed to the solution to the word problem. So it was going and talking about the differences between that and he totally got it and was able to go and adjust his answers and, and send them right back into me. So it's, it's really helped with that, but the, the tutoring or the one-on-one uh, -on -one with the students, it, it doesn't happen where you talk to every single student every single day. It's, you may talk to 10 on one day, 15 the next day, then have two days where you only talk to a couple each. So I'm going to release the mic now and let somebody else go. Dave, that was, that was absolutely great. Really, really appreciate it. Um, and I think that, that did a great job of sketching out uh, how different this teaching environment is uh, from the standard uh, bricks and mortar environment and obviously hybrid ones have increasingly become like this and I think that's a lot of the pioneering now but, but I think that's really, really helpful. 
One thing I, I think that also jumped out of what you said was uh, students get immediate feedback of how they're doing, um, which is really helpful because right now in the traditional system, uh, feedback often only comes you know every few weeks whenever you have a test, and then the test is designed so that a large percentage of students actually fail, um, which doesn't make them feel particularly good about themselves. Clayton and I and Curtis Johnson are actually going to be coming out with a new chapter of Disrupting Class uh, in, in, in the next uh, few months or so in which we will uh, be talking a lot about this uh, idea of what's the fundamental job to be done of the student. And to that end, there was a question, um, you know, Catherine, student satisfaction, how does Florida Virtual School think about that? If they're still keeping the student in the center as they design this, how do they think about satisfaction? When Florida Virtual School um, started the program, they were very concerned about the satisfaction of the student, and that has not changed. It still remains a very student-centric school. Um, at the end of each course, students must fill out a survey um, that asks questions about their satisfaction with the teacher, with the program, um, why they are taking a Florida Virtual School course. Um, these responses help the school figure out how to better serve students, um, what kind of courses they might need to add, um, and why students are using the courses, and if they are enjoying, if they're learning from them. Now, what, one of the things I think what we see from the student satisfaction is a, is a couplefold. One, students like these courses quite a bit, and one of the reasons that you see this explosive growth, and, and if you download the case study, uh, you'll see it on page, let me, let me get the exact page number, it's page 13. It's just fascinating how from just 77 enrollments uh, in the most recent year completed, it's boomed up to about 154,000 enrollments. And if you look at it and think about that S-curve in disrupting class, it looks quite a bit like it. And, and it's because, if I can jump in from what I've heard you say today, Catherine, um, by switching to a model that allowed for organic growth, you could really see these students want this. Mm -hmm. And a fascinating thing happened. Uh, and and I'll, I'll end with this story and then one more that I'm going to put you on the spot for, Catherine, but uh, w which was that in the past legislative se session, one of the um, state senators tried to cut back the program and say you can only offer it for core classes inside of the schools rather than uh, areas of non-consumption, which would have destroyed uh, a, a lot about it. Um, a YouTube campaign started by thousands and thousands of students in the state of Florida who uh, just just um, said, you're not closing this school. This is something that really helps us. And unlike some protestations of school closures, we have results to show that this one is a good school and is working. And it really was a fascinating uh, thing. And, and I'll jump back. Rob, you're, you're right. That organic growth term is really critical there because you really know it was nailing the job to be done here. And by linking the funding only to performance, you can make sure that it's growing in a way that is meeting, mm -hmm. uh, that the students are actually learning. And I also want to add that um, the enrollment numbers are also testament to the um, student satisfaction because none of these courses are required of the students. They aren't required to um, sign up for Florida Virtual School courses. It's something that you do on your own um, that doesn't have any, that is not a graduation requirement. Um, they're doing it because they enjoy the courses, they feel like they're learning from them, and there's no reason why they must stay in these classes or why they must take them. Now, one more thing that I want to, and, and then we'll conclude on this, Steve. Um, the, uh, so Florida Virtual School starts out and it creates this unbelievable uh, environment and so forth, and recently they've been focusing on working to make the work more engaging itself. They've debuted a whole new course in the past uh, year that really blows my mind. Can you, tell, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it's really exciting. Um, Florida Virtual School has, they've been thinking about it, they say, learning can be fun. There's no reason why it needs to be a torturous process for the students. And so one thing that they have been experimenting with is um, a new program called Conspiracy Code. And what it is, is it's the first um, this is the first complete online game-based course for high school students. So what it is, is it's basically a computer game um, that students 
learn American history through. Um, how it works is each student is two characters, and they must go through and they must save ten pieces of corrupted American history. Um, some people will argue that American history has already been corrupted, but <laughs> uh, but but nevertheless, so we're running out of time, I know, and, and people have been really fortunate here. But if you log on and, and, and search for conspiracy code on Google, uh, I, I think it will blow people's mind about how rich an environment Florida Virtual School, in partnership with 360 Ed, um, 360 Ed. Have, have created this, and it really, really is. It, it really blows your mind. Yeah, and this summer was when it. Well, this fall, I guess, actually was when um, they debuted this game, and so it'll be interesting to see how it turns out. And they are doing some. Some of the universities are doing some research to see how it affects the brain waves of the students. Um, to see if they are learning from it. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating. Like Catherine just said, brain studies as well as studies on the efficacy and the results, mm -hmm. and are they actually learning? Mm -hmm. And I, I think we're going to learn a lot because game-based learning has been something that people have been excited about for a long time. Yeah. Um, and here we have a full course based on it. To not for everyone, there's another American history course if you mm -hmm. prefer a more traditional path. Uh, but but for but for many people, I think this will really uh, turn them on to learning. So. It's an exciting path. Steve, I'm going to give the mic back to you, but one, one moment, which is thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Catherine, for all of your work. Uh, and uh, just look at this lineup up there right now. Steve on, on Saturday, Larry Cuban, Halverson, Tim Magner, Dennis Lipke, Ken Robinson. I'm just drooling. So thank you so much, Steve, for the opportunity to be a part of your session. Oh, it was a pleasure tonight, especially. Catherine, really appreciate your coming on. Love the report, love the session. Uh, so much to learn there. Obviously a very dynamic set of questions and, and I think we got to most of them. So I'm going to clap while those are clapping there. Thank you for coming on tonight. Thanks to those of you who attended. You, you do see we have a fun lineup, so please do join us again. Uh, Michael and Catherine, final thanks to you. Do note that when you leave the session, everybody, a uh, survey will come up and it helps us if you fill that out to let us know what you thought and what we could do differently. So uh, thanks again, everybody. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Catherine. And I'll go ahead and leave the room open for a few minutes. But in order for the recording to process, we do have to have you leave. So when you're ready to go, just click File and Exit or close the window down. Have a great evening, everyone. So Michael, is that you recommending the uh, innovator's prescription? It's a book about healthcare and uh, that Clayton wrote with our colleague Jason Wong, who co-founded in the Site Institute with me, and uh, the late Jerome uh, Grossman. But idea for idea, it's just a fascinating book about healthcare, and I think they bring in a lot of themes that are very applicable to education too. Okay, thanks for adding to the already huge stack on my desk. That's what we're here for. <laughs> Uh, you guys did a great job tonight. That was really, really fun. So I really appreciate what you're doing, and I think it's great for the audience. And um, uh, I, I really get a lot out of it personally. Okay, so I'm going to close this down. And uh, Michael, I'll look forward to seeing you online. And nice to meet you, Catherine.